Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. Okay, let's see. Right, modern stagings of a Shakespearean classic. Well, like I told you last week, I think that's a great topic for your paper. So the title will be something like.、Um, I'm not really sure. Probably something like "20th Century Stagings of a Midsummer Night's Dream." Yes, I like that. Straightforward and to the point. So, how's the research going? Well, that's what I came to talk to you about. I was wondering if you happen to have a copy of the Peter Brook production of A Midsummer Night's Dream in your video collection. I've been looking for it everywhere, and I'm having a really hard time tracking it down. <laughs> That's because it doesn't exist. Huh? You mean in your collection or at all? I mean at all. That particular production was never filmed or recorded. Oh no! I had no idea. From what I had read, that production, like. It influenced every other production of the play that came after it, so I just assume it had been filmed or videotaped. Oh, it definitely was a landmark production, and it's not like it ran for just a week. But either it was never filmed, or if it was, the film's been lost. <laughs> and it's ironic because there's even a film about the making of the production, but none of the production itself. So now, what do I do if there's no video? Well, think about it. This is the most important 20th century staging of a Midsummer Night's Dream, right? But how can I write about Brooks' interpretation of the play if I can't see his production? Just because there's no recording doesn't mean you can't figure out how it influenced other productions.、Oh, I I guess there's enough material around, but it'll be a challenge. True, but think about it. You're writing about dramatic arts, the theater, and that's the nature of theater, isn't it? You mean because it's live when the performance is finished? That's it. Unless it's filmed, it's gone. But that doesn't mean we can't study it. And of course, some students in this class are writing about productions in the 19th century, and there are no videos of those. You know, one of the challenges for people who study theater is to find ways of talking about something that's really so transient, about something that, in a sense, doesn't exist. Why does the man visit the professor? What is the subject of the man's paper? What do the speakers say about Peter Brook's production of *A Midsummer Night's Dream*? What point does the professor make when she mentions that some students are writing about 19th-century productions of Shakespeare's plays? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. So now, what do I do if there's no video? Well, think about it. 
This is the most important 20th century staging of a Midsummer Night's Dream, right? Why does the professor say this? Well, think about it. This is the most important 20th century staging of a Midsummer Night's Dream, right? Listen to part of a lecture in an art history class. Good morning. Ready to continue our review of prehistoric art? Um, today we'll be covering the Upper Paleolithic period,、um, which I'm roughly defining as the period from 35,000 to 8,000 BC.、Um, a lot of those cave drawings you've all seen come from this period. Uh, but we'll also be talking about portable works of art,、uh, things that could be carried around from place to place. Here's one example. This sculpture is called the Lady with the Hood, and it was carved from ivory,、uh, probably a, a mammoth's tusk. Its age is a bit of a mystery. According to one source, it dates from、uh, 22,000 BC. But other sources claim it's been dated closer to 30,000 BC.、Uh, Amy, why don't we know the exact date when this head was made? That's a fair question. We're talking about prehistory here,、uh, so obviously the artists didn't put a, a signature or a date on anything they did. So, how do we know when this figure was carved? Last semester, I took an archaeology class, and we spent a lot of time on、uh, studying ways to date things. One technique I remember was、um, using the location of an object to date it, like how deep it was buried. That would be stratigraphy. Stratigraphy is used for dating portable art. When archaeologists are digging in a site, they make very careful notes about which stratum,、uh, which layer of earth they find things in. And you know, the general rule is that the oldest layers are at the lowest level. But this only works if the site hasn't been touched and the layers are intact.、Um, a problem with this dating method is that an object could have been carried around. Used for several generations before it was discarded, so it might be much older than the layer or even the site where it was found. the、uh, The stratification technique gives us the minimum age of an object, which isn't necessarily its its true age.、Uh, Tom, in your archaeology class, did you talk about radiocarbon dating? Yeah, we did.、Um, that had to do with、uh, chemical analysis, something to do with measuring the amount of radiocarbon that's left in、uh, organic stuff.、Uh, because we know how fast radiocarbon decays, we can figure out the age of the organic material. The key word there is organic. Is art made of organic material? Well, you said the lady with the hood was carved out of ivory. That's organic. Absolutely. Any other examples? Well, when they did those cave drawings, didn't they use like charcoal or maybe colors, dyes made from plants? Fortunately, they did at, at least some of the time. So it turns out that radiocarbon dating works for a lot of prehistoric art.、Uh, but again, there's a problem.、Um, This technique destroys what it analyzes, so you, you have to chip off bits of the object for testing.、Uh, obviously, we're reluctant to do that in some cases, and and apart from that, there, there's another problem: the the date tells you the age of the material, say a bone or or a tree. the The object is made from, but but not the date when the artist actually created it. So, with radiocarbon dating. We get the maximum 
possible age for the object, but it could be younger. Okay, um, let's say our scientific analysis has produced an age range. Can we narrow it down? Um, could we look for similar styles or motifs? You know, try to find things common to one time period. We do that all the time. And when we see similarities in pieces of art, we assume some connection in, in time or place. But, but is it possible that we could be imposing our own values on that analysis? I'm sorry, I don't get your point. Um, well, we have all kinds of preconceived ideas about how artistic styles developed. For example, a, a lot of people think the presence of details demonstrates that the work was done by a more sophisticated artist, while um, a lack of detail suggests a, a primitive style. But trends in art in the last century or so certainly challenge that idea. Don't get me wrong, though. Um, analyzing the styles of prehistoric artifacts can help dating them. But we need to be careful with the idea that um, artistic development occurs in, in a straight line, from simple to complex representations. What you're saying is, I mean, I get the feeling that this is like a legal process, like building a legal case. The more pieces of evidence we have, the closer we get to the truth. Great analogy. And now you can see why we don't have an exact date for our sculpture, the lady with the hood. What is the talk mainly about? According to the professor, when might stratigraphy provide misleading information about a portable object? What are two disadvantages of radiocarbon dating? What is the professor's opinion about the practice of dating a piece of art by analyzing its artistic style? How does the woman summarize the professor's main point in the talk? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. 
Why don't we know the exact date when this head was made? That's a fair question. We're talking about prehistory here. Uh, so, obviously, the artists didn't put a, a signature or a date on anything they did. Why does the professor say this? Uh, so, obviously, the artists didn't put a, a signature or a date on anything they did. Listen to Listen to a conversation between a student and a food service manager. Excuse me, Mrs. Hansen? My name's John. Uh John Grant. I work as a waiter in the campus dining hall in the faculty dining room. What can I do for you, John? Well, I work weeknights, except uh, for Friday. I was uh, wondering if I could um, switch from working the dinner service to working at lunch. That's going to be a problem. I'm afraid we don't have any openings at lunchtime. A lot of students want to work then, so it's really rare for us to have an open spot at that time of day. Oh. Well, you see, I've joined this group, the uh, University Jazz Band, and the band's practice time's right around dinner time. You know, it's... So hard to get into this group. I, I must have auditioned like ten times since I've been at the school. So I'm, anyway. So I was really hoping to have the dinner hour free so I can go to practice. Well, we do have other open times, like breakfast. Uh, that won't work. I I'm sorry. I mean that I can't work that early. I have this really important music class I got to take, and it's like first thing in the morning. Well. If you don't mind working in the kitchen, we've got some pretty flexible hours for students doing food prep work, anything from early morning to late afternoon. What's uh, prep work? You prepare food for the cooks. You know, like cutting up vegetables for soup or cleaning greens for salads. Oh, hmm, that doesn't sound. Uh, I mean, being a waiter, uh, I get to see a lot of the professors, like. In a different light, you know, we joke around a little, you know. In the classroom, they always have to be pretty formal, but well, the money's no different since we pay students the same amount for any of the jobs here in food service. So it's up to you. Oh man, I always thought that sacrificing for my art, well, that didn't mean working long hours as a musician for like no money.、Uh, I didn't think it'd mean peeling carrots. Let me see. I'm offering you something that has the hours you want. It's right here on campus, and you make as much money as you did being a waiter. Quite a sacrifice. I'm sorry. I know you're just trying to help.、Uh, I guess.、Uh, I guess I should look into the food prep job. Okay then. I'll tell the kitchen manager that you'll stop by tomorrow to talk about the job and schedule your hours, and I'll let the dining hall manager know that he needs to find a new waiter for the evening. Oh. Okay, I guess that's it. Um, thanks, Mrs. Hanson. Why does the man go to see the woman? What activity does the man want to be able to do at dinner time? The woman asks the man to consider a different job. What kind of work would the man have to do for the new job?
What does the man imply about his job as a waiter? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. Let me see. I'm offering you something that has the hours you want. It's right here on campus, and you make as much money as you did being a waiter. Quite a sacrifice. What does the woman imply when she says this? Quite a sacrifice. Listen to part of a lecture in a history class. The professor has been discussing ancient Egypt. Okay, so one of the challenges that faced ancient civilizations like Egypt was timekeeping, calendars. When you have to grow food for whole cities of people, it's important to plant your crops at the right time. And when you start having financial obligations. Rents, taxes—you have to keep track of how often you pay. So today we'll look at how the Egyptians addressed these problems. In fact, they ended up using two different calendars: one to keep track of the natural world or their、uh, their agricultural concerns, and another one that was used to keep track of the business functions of the kingdom. So let's take a look at the hows and whys of one ancient Egyptian calendar system, starting with the Nile River. Why the Nile? Well, there's no other way to put it. Egyptian life basically revolved around the mysterious rise and fall of the river. The success of their agricultural system depended upon them knowing when the river would change. So naturally, their first calendar was divided up into three seasons, each based on the river's changes: inundation, subsidence, and harvest. The first season was the flooding or inundation, when the Nile Valley was essentially submerged in water for a few months or so, and afterwards, during the season of subsidence. The water would subside or recede, revealing a new layer of fertile black silt and allowing for the planting of various crops. And finally, the time of the year would arrive when the valley would produce crops such as wheat, barley, fruit, all ready to harvest. Okay. So it was very important to the ancient Egyptians to know when their Nile-based seasons would occur. Their way of life depended upon it. Now, the way they used to count time was based on the phases of the moon, which regularly and predictably goes through a cycle, starting with the new moon, then to a full moon, and back again to the new moon. Now this cycle was then used to determine the length of their months. So、um, one lunar cycle was one Egyptian month, and about four of the months would constitute a season. Now twelve of these months was an approximately three hundred and fifty-four day year. So they had a 354-day agricultural calendar that was designed to help them determine、uh, when the Nile would inundate the land. Well, of course, it had to be more complicated than that. The average amount of time between floodings wasn't actually 354 days; 
I mean, although it varies, the average was clearly longer than 354 days. So how did they keep this shorter calendar in step with the actual flooding of the Nile? Well, their astronomers had discovered that uh, at a certain time of year, the brightest star, Sirius, would disappear. Actually, it'd be hidden in the glare of the sun. And then, uh, a couple of months later, one morning in the eastern sky just before dawn, Sirius would reappear. And it happened regularly, uh, about every 365 days. Even more significantly, the reappearance of Sirius would occur a around the same time as the Nile's flooding. And this annual event is called a heliacal rising. The heliacal rising was a fair indicator of when the Nile would flood. The next new moon uh, after the heliacal rising of Sirius, which happened in the last month of the calendar year, marked the new year. And uh, because the ancient Egyptians were using the lunar cycle in combination with this heliacal rising, some years ended up having 12 lunar months, while others had 13 lunar months, if Sirius didn't rise in the 12th month. Even though the length of the agricultural calendar still fluctuated, with some years having 12 months and others having 13, it ended up being much more reliable than it was before. They continually adjusted to the heliacal rising of Sirius, ensuring that they never got too far off in their seasons. This new calendar was ideal because, well, it worked well for agricultural purposes as well as for knowing when to have traditional religious festivals. So, that was their first calendar. But, was it any way to run a government? They didn't think so. For administrative purposes, it was very inconvenient to have years of different lengths. So, another calendar was introduced, an administrative one, probably soon after 3000 B.C. They declared a 365-day year, with 12 months per year, with exactly 30 days each month, with an extra five days at the end of each year. This administrative calendar existed alongside the earlier agricultural and religious calendar uh, that depended on the heliacal rising of Sirius. This administrative calendar was much easier to use for things like scheduling taxes and, and other things that had to be paid on time. Over time, the calendar got out of step with seasons and the flooding of the Nile, but for bureaucratic purposes, they didn't mind. What is the lecture mainly about? Why does the professor mention the names of the seasons in ancient Egypt? Why was the heliacal rising of Sirius important to the Egyptians?
Once the Egyptians realized the significance of the heliacal rising of Sirius, what change did they make to their agricultural calendar? What are two points the professor makes about the administrative calendar? What is the professor explaining when she says this? But was it any way to run a government? Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. Okay, now I want to talk about an animal that has a fascinating set of defense mechanisms, and that's the octopus, one of the unusual creatures that live in the sea. The octopus is prey to many species, including humans. So how does it escape its predators? Well, let me back up here a second. Anyone ever hear of uh, Proteus? Proteus was a god in Greek mythology who could change form. He could make himself look like a lion or a stone or a tree, anything he wanted. And he could go through a whole series of changes very quickly. Well, the octopus is the real world version of Proteus. Just like Proteus, the octopus can go through all kinds of incredible transformations. And it does this in three ways, by changing color, by changing its texture, and by changing its size and shape. For me, the most fascinating transformation is when it changes its color. It's a normal skin color. The one it generally presents is um, either red or brown, or even gray. And it's speckled with dark spots. But when it wants to blend in with its environment to hide from its enemies, it can take on the color of its immediate surroundings, the ocean floor, a rock, a piece of coral, whatever. Uh, Charles? Do we know how that works? I mean, how they change colors? Well, we know that the reaction that takes place is not chemical in nature. The color changes are executed by two different kinds of cells in the octopus's skin mainly by color cells on the skin's surface, called chromatophores. Chromatophores consist of tiny sacs filled with colored dye. There might be a couple hundred of these color sacs per square millimeter of the octopus's skin. And depending on the species, they can come in as many as five different colors. Each one of these sacs is controlled by muscles. If the muscles are relaxed, the sac shrinks, and all you see is a little white point. But if the muscles contract, then the sac expands, and you can see the colors. And by expanding different combinations of these color sacs to different degrees, the octopus can create all sorts of colors. Uh, yes, Elizabeth? And just with various combinations of those five colors, they can recreate any color in their environment? 
Well, they can no doubt create a lot with just those five colors, but you're right. Maybe they can't mimic every color around them. So that's where the second kind of cell comes in. Just below the chromatophores is a layer of cells that reflect light from the environment. And these cells help the octopus create a precise match with the colors that surround them. The colors from the color sacs are supplemented with colors that are reflected from the environment, and that's how they're able to mimic colors with such precision. So that's how octopuses mimic colors. But they don't just mimic the colors in their environment. They can also mimic the texture of objects in their environment. They have these little projections on their skin that allow them to resemble various textures. The projections are called papillae. If the octopus wants to have a rough texture, it raises the papillae. If it wants to have a smooth texture, it flattens out the papillae. So it can acquire a smooth texture to blend in with the sandy bottom of the sea. So the octopus has the ability to mimic both the color and the texture of its environment. And it's truly amazing how well it can blend in with its surroundings. You can easily swim within a few feet of an octopus and never see it. I read that they often hide from predators by squirting out a cloud of ink or something like that. Yes, the octopus can release a cloud of ink if it feels threatened. But it doesn't hide behind it as is generally believed. Um, the ink cloud is, it serves to distract a predator while the octopus makes its escape. Um, now, there's a third way that octopuses can transform themselves to blend in with or mimic their environment, and that's by changing their shape and size, well, at least their apparent size. The muscular system of the octopus enables it to be very flexible, to assume all sorts of shapes and postures. So it can contract into the shape of a little round stone and sit perfectly still on the sea floor. Or it can nestle up in the middle of a plant and take the shape of one of the leaves. Even Proteus would be impressed, I think. What is the lecture mainly about? Why does the professor first mention Proteus? How does an octopus change color to match the colors in its environment? What does the professor say about the function of the papillae?
What two examples does the professor mention to describe the octopus's ability to change its shape? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. So the octopus has the ability to mimic both the color and the texture of its environment, and it's truly amazing how well it can blend in with its surroundings. You can easily swim within a few feet of an octopus and never see it. Why does the professor say this? You can easily swim within a few feet of an octopus and never see it.